Can wait a minute or two longer here. We can get started. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Brain Health and Wellness Initiative Series. Tonight, our presenter is Leanne Stuver, and she's going to be talking about the importance of cognitive fitness and how to train your brain. My name is Hannah Doles, and along with my colleague, Nicole Herbert Hale, we provide care navigation in the JFSA Dementia Care Navigation Program. Our program establishes an empowering environment to help improve the quality of life of those who have dementia or at risk of developing de dementia, all while helping family caregivers reduce the stress and burden that often occurs. At JFSA, we understand the importance in working with our clients' strengths and applying a person-centered approach to care, which extends throughout our multidisciplinary team of geriatricians, nurses, social workers, and geriatric psychiatrists. Nicole and I meet our clients where they are at and develop individualized care plans that produce solutions to presenting problems. From linking persons with dementia and their family to community resources, to following them with their medical management. We are there as their point of guidance, as well as a listening ear. We consider the intersectionality of one's life when creating interventions that adhere to their biopsychosocial needs and experiences. So during our presentation today, um, you'll see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A box. Um, and we do ask that you um, ask questions at the end of the webinar. But tonight, Leanne is having a bit of participation with um, everybody. So there may be some um, times where we'd like you to try and submit some answers. So please use the Q&A box during that time instead of the chat. All right. And then I do just want to make note that we are very pleased to offer the continuing education credits. Um, we just wanted to make sure that um, you're aware that it may take 30 days from the date of your application. So at the end of the presentation tonight, you will receive a survey in the next few days. And once you complete that survey, it will take 30 days from that point to get your CE credit um, emailed to you. Um, and it will be emailed to you at the email address that you provided during registration. And the address that the email address that you use to access the webinar must be the same one as the one you provided at the beginning of the, um, when you signed up for this course tonight. And entering a different or incomplete email address will prevent your CE from being issued. So if you aren't sure about which email you use to attend, just check your original confirmation email or contact one of us and we can certainly tell you. Again, tonight, Leanne Stuver is presenting, and she is a registered nurse with an extensive background in health education. She worked as a hospital nurse for 10 years before earning her master's degree in education. She has over 20 years experience in the planning and implementation of adult education programs at Menorah Park, where she served as their director of lifelong learning. Ms. Stuver teaches community education classes about the importance of lifelong learning and brain health. She is passionate about educating the community in practical ways they can learn to support their health and wellness. She is an accomplished savvy caregiver, 
Savvy Caregiver Workshops Facilitator at JFSA, and she's officially trained by the co-founder and co-creator of the National Savvy Caregiver Program, Dr. Carrie Sherman. Leanne has also been involved in numerous speaking engagements and is currently a dementia support group and a Savvy Caregiver Workshops Facilitator at JFSA. Hannah, thank you so much, and so glad that you could all be here with us this evening. And hopefully you're all ready to train your brain tonight because we're going to talk about everything cognitive fitness. So let's think about what that actually means. So the word cognitive relates to our thought processes, all those different functions that our brain does for us that often we don't even think about until we have a problem with one of them, but that is our memory. It's our attention, our ability to pay attention to things, our perception, how we take in all, everything in our surrounding environment and how our brain processes that. Language, both our spoken language and our understanding language that is spoken to us and also executive function. And when you hear executive function, that means all of those activities that our brain does, like planning, organizing, kind of knowing where we're going, our, our place in the world. So those are all those executive functions that our brain takes care of for us. So that's what cognitive means. It covers all of those areas. And we probably could come up with an exhaustive list of other things that fall under these, but these are the big ones. Now, fitness means, according to the Oxford Languages Dictionary, the quality of being suitable to fulfill a particular role or task. So we often think about fitness of more of our body. But tonight, I really want you to start thinking of fitness for your brain in a whole new way. So cognitive fitness activities, according to AARP, are mentally engaging activities or exercises that challenge a person's ability to think. So these are thinking activities that improve the ability of our brain to execute all of those necessary cognitive functions that we need in order to be successful every day to get everything we need to get done um, from work things, personal things, relaxation, everything we do, our brain controls. So we have to make sure that our brain is fit and able to do those things for us. Now, if you've been to my classes before, I always show this picture. <laughs> and no, the brain doesn't have all these different colors, but this picture really shows you all these different lobes of the brain. And all these different things we've talked about are scattered throughout the brain. So it's really our entire brain that we need to make sure stays fit. So that front red part, the frontal lobe, that's where our problem solving, um, a lot of our speaking is processed in that area. That blue temporal lobe, that's key for our memory formation and hearing is also in that area. That yellow parietal lobe, um, reading takes place in that um, area. Also knowing right from left, understanding where our body is in space. Uh, the green in the back, the occipital lobe, very vital for our vision and our color perception. And that purple area at the bottom um, is for balance and a lot of our voluntary and fine muscle control. And so think about all the things you do each and every day 
and you've involved all of those different parts of your brain when you're doing it. So in order to do all those things you want to do every day, we need to make sure our brain is functioning well. Now, digging deeper inside the brain, our brain is made up of neurons. So our brain is the communication center for our body. And these neurons are brain cells. And we're born with about 100 billion nerve cells. And those nerve cells have that kind of big part in the middle, and then they have a bunch of branches that come off of them. And those branches are called dendrites. And those are the really important parts of our neurons because those are how our different brain cells um, communicate with each other, both electrically and chemically. So the more of those branches that we have, the better the communication between all of our brain cells is. Now, there's some big terms that I wanna talk about when we're talking about cognitive fitness. And all of these things go on throughout our lifetime, no matter how old we are. They are all lifelong things. The first one is neurogenesis. This means it's the brain's ability to generate new brain cells, so grow new neurons. Now, it wasn't that long ago that we didn't think the brain was able to grow new cells. When I was in nursing school back in the 1980s, they didn't know this yet. They thought that once um, brain cells died, they were not able to regenerate. And we now know that that is not true. Now, the, the one area that they know for sure has the most ability to grow new brain cells is in the hippocampus. And that's in that blue temporal lobe on the side of the brain. And that area of the brain is vital in forming and storing memories. So they know for a fact that new brain cells can be generated in that area. The rest of the brain, what is almost more important is the second term, and that's neuroplasticity. And if you look at that plastic that's kind of in the middle, that's what it really means. The brain's ability to adapt and change, to be malleable. And this is what cognitive fitness can do for us. When we work on our cognitive fitness, we actually change how our brain works and it's usually for the better. Another way you can think about this is you probably all know someone who maybe had a stroke or a brain injury and maybe had some deficits physically from that event. And through extensive physical therapy or speech therapy, some of those functions are able to be improved. And that is neuroplasticity at work. So other brain cells in the area of where the damage took place learn new skills. So after someone has a stroke, they may have lost their ability to speak, but through speech therapy, they learn to speak again. Those brain cells that died don't regenerate but neighboring brain cells or brain cells in other parts of the brain learn to take on that job of speaking. So they are, they act like plastic, they're malleable. So that neuroplasticity is real important when we think about being able to do new and different things with other parts of our brain. And the last topic that I really wanna talk about is cognitive reserve. This is so important for us to think about throughout our lifetime. So this is the brain's protection against the development of brain-related disease and trauma. So we want to have this cognitive reserve built up. It's kind of like building up your physical fitness. So if you're really physically fit and then you have an injury and have to be in bed for two weeks, you are able with time to get back and moving. But compare a physically fit person who's been in bed two weeks with a frail person who has to be in bed for two weeks. 
that is much more detrimental to them because they didn't have that physical reserve to begin with. That's how we have to think about this cognitive reserve. We want to build up cognitive reserve in our brain so that if we have a disease or a trauma to our brain, we have some backup cells to take over and do the job for us. I'm going to show you a few different images to kind of really get the idea of what cognitive reserve is. This one is from sharpbrains.com. And this picture depicts how we want to live our life as we get older. So there's two arching, there's two arches with two different colors. And that darker line that goes right above the people's heads in this design is the average average cognitive performance throughout our lifetime. But if we improve our, our performance with that gold line, as we get into old age, we have a buffer that prevents that onset of symptoms and delays disease. Sometimes this, this diagram is a little hard, harder to understand, but I have a better way. And this is my favorite way to describe cognitive reserve. So our goal with cognitive reserve is to build more brain cells that have more connections. And when we saw that picture of those neurons and I talked about those branches, let's relate it to a tree. So higher cognitive reserve means that our brain is better able to combat those diseases or trauma because it has a lot more branches. So picture this tree that it's, is at the bottom of the slide. A very pretty, probably a maple tree, lots of branches, lots of leaves. When you walk around it, it's full on all sides, okay? So that is a highly cognitive reserve tree, so to speak. Now imagine that it gets hit by lightning and one big branch falls off. If we are not standing right where that branch is missing, the tree still looks relatively healthy and it has the ability to grow back and fill in that missing spot. So that's kind of the idea of cognitive reserve. Now, let's look at a tree that's poor or low cognitive reserve. So we can always picture that Charlie Brown Christmas tree, that pathetic little tree that doesn't have very many branches, doesn't have very many leaves. This is how I like to depict lower cognitive reserve and how our brain would be more susceptible to disease or trauma with loss of brain function because it doesn't have that backup. So imagine lightning hitting this tree. There wouldn't be much left because it doesn't have that cognitive reserve. It doesn't have any backup branches and leaves to fill in the spot. So that's how I want you to think about it. We want to build branches that connect and communicate throughout our brain as much as we can. So now your question is, how do we do that? How do we build this cognitive reserve and increase our cognitive fitness as a protective mechanism? And it has been scientifically shown to be a protective mechanism of, of preventing the symptoms and the onset of dementia, all types of dementia, but particularly Alzheimer's. It doesn't mean you don't have the disease, but the disease doesn't get, give you symptoms as early if you have a higher cognitive reserve to protect your brain function in the process. So cognitive fitness and working out our brain is definitely a preventative measure for dementia and Alzheimer's, or even just helping us if we fall and hit our head and have a concussion or are in a car accident. All of this idea of cognitive reserve is very protective of our brain's function, that it continue to do all those things it does for us on a daily basis. So how do we do it? Well, there's three things that your brain thrives on. It loves to do new things. 
things that you have never done before. Now, you might feel uncomfortable doing these new things, but your brain is just lighting up and is so excited because it loves the challenge of doing new things. Now, the second word, novel, that you might say, yeah, well, that means the same thing as new, but I'm going to talk about it in a little bit different way. So I want to say novel is to do things a little differently. So not do it the same way every time. So let's say that you really enjoy word search puzzles. You like letter puzzles, word puzzles better than you like number puzzles. Okay, well, in order for it to be novel, you would need to do different types of word puzzles. So maybe you do some fill in the blank word puzzles. Maybe you do some crossword puzzles, not just do one kind. So your brain likes things done in a different way. They don't, your brain gets bored. It doesn't want to do the same old thing over and over again. And the third thing is it needs to be challenging. So when we talk about cognitive fitness activities, you really should be struggling to do them. So obviously you're not going to do this all day long. You don't need to do cognitive fitness all day long, but when you are really focusing on your cognitive fitness, it should tax your brain or make your brain sweat and make you maybe a little uncomfortable. That's what is growing those new brain cells. Now, when we do something new, our brain can change and adapt. So it connects new cells to each other when we learn something new. Uh, new pathways, maybe it strengthens some connections that are there. But when we do something new, though, that information and that processing in our brain has to go a different way. So it makes our whole brain stronger. So these changes occur when we take in new information. That's how, uh, that's how this new information helps us. Stimulating environments are very important for our brain to thrive. So we also should, we always should be on the lookout for new ways to do something or doing something out of the ordinary. Think of how when you're driving somewhere, if you drive the same route to work or to school or to a religious service, if you drive the same way every time you go, how many of us sometimes kind of zone out and don't pay attention to everything that we see on the drive because our brain is bored with this drive. There's nothing new. It's seeing the same things that it always sees. That's what you want to stimulate your brain with, to always be doing something different. Go a different route. Um, if you are a walker or a runner, don't always walk or run in the exact same pattern. Your brain likes to try new things out. That's what build the, builds this cognitive reserve and these new connections in your brain. Also, if it's something that's really unusual or surprising, that really gets the attention of your brain, especially so you remember it. So that really triggers your memory. So think out new ways of doing things to really work on that cognitive fitness. And your brain thrives on challenging tasks. Yes, you sometimes say, my brain hurts, I'm tired, um, but that's good. When you make your brain tired, that's when you've really gotten the most cognitive fitness benefit out of a task. So explore and discover new places, environments, skills, anything new that, that really challenges you to think in a different way is great. If you like to do certain tasks, like maybe crafts or knitting or puzzles or sewing, whatever it might be, you want to keep increasing that difficulty level if you're looking at that activity as a cognitive fitness activity. There are a lot of computerized games, either on your computer, your tablet, your iPad, maybe even on your phone. And many of them are timed. And I know when I talk to a lot of people, they say, oh, I turned that timer off or I won't do that game because it's timed. It makes me nervous. I don't like it. 
that is actually the best kind of computer or automated game is the one that is timed because that's what really puts your brain under pressure and builds those new brain cells. Now you don't have to do it computerized. You can set just a regular old kitchen timer or a stopwatch or whatever you have handy and you can still put yourself under pressure to do some of these tasks and that increases that challenge level and when you do that, you build more of those brain cell connections and make your brain fitness higher. Now, the key to brain fitness is that we need to make it a habit. Now, how many times do you hear that about physical fitness? If we want to improve our physical fitness, we need to make exercising a routine. We need a daily fitness routine or a weekly fitness routine. We need to make it a habit. We need to get up every morning and go for a walk or go to the gym every day at lunchtime. We build it into our routine so that we accomplish it every day. That's what we need to think about with our brain fitness as well. We want to think about spending 20 minutes a day to make our brain really sweat. Now, that can be break it, broken up. It could maybe be two 10-minute sessions. Maybe you do 10 minutes in the morning before you get on with your day, and maybe you do 10 minutes before you eat dinner at night. That's okay too. But whatever, whatever it is, you need to schedule it and fit it in, just like we think about physical fitness and physical activity. And just like with physical activity, if you really want to have a well-rounded physical fitness, maybe you should incorporate cardio and weight training. So you, and you should um, shake up your routines, one so you don't get bored and the other way so it works out all parts of your body. Same with your brain fitness, your cognitive fitness. It shouldn't be the same thing every day. New, novel, challenging. So you want it, you want to have to really think about it, but you want to vary it. So if you're somebody that really likes to do the Sudoku puzzles, maybe you do those one day, you do a crossword puzzle another day. Maybe you do a jigsaw puzzle a different day. Maybe you build a model of some kind, whether it's Legos or uh, a wooden model, whatever. Maybe you learn to knit. That's another thing that really can challenge your brain. But you need to vary that routine and you need to continually choose things that get harder and harder. So if you like a certain kind of puzzle, for example, and you can just sit down and relax and do it, that doesn't count as cognitive fitness. I want you to pick one of the harder ones Maybe the Sunday New York Times crossword puzzle. That's the hardest day of the week as far as crossword puzzles on Sunday. And maybe you can only answer three or four of the whole puzzle in that 20 minutes. But the time you spend thinking about those in that 20 minutes, you've really grown those brain cells. Then the rest of the day, when you're looking for something to do, you can do the enjoyable puzzles that you like but you really want to think about working on something in that 20 minutes that really makes your brain sweat or that makes your brain think in a different way than you do all the rest of the day. I'm going to give you some things tonight that we're going to work on that hopefully will build some of that brain fitness and hopefully will make your brain work in a little bit different way. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at some optical illusions. Now, optical illusions can use color, light, or patterns to create different types of images that can be deceptive or misleading to our brains. So these, these optical illusions challenge our brain, especially the ones we're gonna do today are pictures that have two images in them. And probably you'll see one of them right away when I show you the image. 
but the challenge is to find the second image. And we'll, I'll, I'll change the image a little to help you find them. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show a picture and I, got, I want you to put in the Q&A what you see. Maybe you only see one, maybe you see both. Once I get everybody seeing both, the thing that really challenges your brain is when you go back and forth between the two because you can't really see them both at the same time. You have to kind of see one and then see the other. So let's take a look at the first one. So put in the Q&A what you see in this image and Hannah will share with me the answers that she sees. Okay, I see duck is popular, mm -hmm. rabbit. Okay, did the same person put both or are they different people that are putting? Um, I see on a couple, first a rabbit, then a duck. Okay. Or the opposite. So <laughs> there is a duck and a rabbit in this picture. Now, if you only see one of them, I'm gonna change the picture a little bit and help you to see them both. So if I alter the picture a little bit, does that help you see the duck a little bit better since it's more in the direct way? Now I'm gonna move my mouse. So here's the beak. Hannah, you can see my arrow, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's the beak and there's the eye with the head of the duck. And this is his neck down here. Okay, so there's the duck. Now let me switch and help you see the rabbit. If I change it a little bit, now these are the ears, still the eye and the rabbit's nose. Mm -hmm. And now let me put the picture back the way it was to begin with. Now, hopefully you can actually see the duck and the rabbit. And by switching back and forth with your brain, you are working your brain out to see those two images that are superimposed. I'm always really impressed that people can draw these images because I'm not very artistic. So to be able to draw an image that has these two in it, I'm always impressed by. Let's try another one. What do you see in this picture? Waiting on some answers here. Okay. There are two okay. images. Okay, I have someone that wrote a lady looking away. Okay. And then lady turning away wearing a hat and fuzzy coat. Yep. And then there's a few answers saying an old woman. Yes. Now I don't have this picture to be able to move around, but I will show you with my mouse. So this was actually a cartoon from the early 1900s that a British cartoonist called my wife and my mother-in-law <laughs> is what, how he said it. But here is the young woman. She's turned away. This is her nose. There's an eyelash. Here's her hair, her ear. Here's her jaw. She's looking away. She has a hat with some feathers on the front kind of has like a scarf on the back and her fuzzy coat. And she also has a necklace here, okay? That's the younger woman looking away. Now, if we switch our brain a little, there's also an older woman here. This is her nose. Here is one of her eyes, her hair, her scarf on her head. The line that was the necklace on the young woman is the mouth. Here's her chin. And she also has that furry coat on. Mm -hmm. So now again, 
flip back and forth between the young woman and the old woman. And that is a real workout for your brain to switch those back and forth. And there's no rhyme or reason to which one we see first when we see some of these. Um, it's not proven that men see one or women see one. It's just kind of the way our brain perceives the picture of what we see first. We're gonna do one more. Let's do one more optical illusion. I have some surprised oh. uh, participants at that. But when you okay. it out. <laughs> that one was harder. So that yeah. first one was easier. This one is even harder. At least I think it was. I had trouble with this the first time I saw it. What two images do you see in this one? A couple saying a frog. Yep. Any other answers? There is a frog. I want to see. I have another answer, but I want to see if a couple people okay. agree here. There is a frog. So the frog is right a here. Horse. A horse? There is a horse. Okay, I am really impressed that people could see the horse because I could not see the horse. But I'm going to help those of you that maybe can't see the horse. I'm going to change the image a little bit. When I change it this way, can you see the horse? Oops. Yeah. So changing that perspective, which you're not really supposed to do with optical illusions, but I'm helping you to see both of those. Another thing you sometimes can do with optical illusions is add color. And so by adding color, that can sometimes, but again, you kind of have to go back and forth between yeah. the two. Yeah, <laughs> so turn it around a little bit. Or whatever. So <laughs> if you ever find some optical illusion puzzles, either online or in a puzzle book of some type, don't hesitate to turn them around because it's sometimes you have to trick your brain to be able to see both of those images. But optical illusions are great things for your brain to be able to sort through that information that's coming in and really be something different that your brain does. So this would be novel because you don't do this all the time. You're, you're doing this in a different way. So now let's think about some other types of things we can do to challenge our brain. So brain teasers are puzzles that requires thought to solve. And it often requires that we think in unconventional ways or not the way we typically solve problems on a daily basis. Um, I have a bunch of puzzle books because I do a lot of these type of classes. Um, the ones that I'm going to show you for the rest of the class are out of this um, book called Brain Games. I think I got it on Amazon. It has a wide variety of puzzles in them and all different types of puzzles, which I really like because even though it's fun to do ones that you enjoy, those aren't the ones that are good for your brain. So it's good to find all different kinds of ones to work on. And I'm just gonna show you a few examples tonight. So I want you to see how many triangles you can count in this image. This challenges your brain to analyze this visual image um, and separate the triangles. So how many triangles do you see? like people to put answers yeah, put, put the number in of how many you can see in this image right i have a couple of people answering 10 okay a couple people said 14 ding 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 14 is the okay. right answer Okay, but I will use my little mouse here to 
help you see where the 14 are. So hopefully you can see my mouse. So there are three big ones with the point up. And here's the third one at the bottom. Then in the middle, there's a big one with the point down. So that's four. So we had three and then four. And then five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, with the little ones in between. This is a pretty easy one. There are some really complex ones. The key to solving these is it's a lot easier to do on with paper and markers because you can outline them and know which ones you've already counted. This one was pretty easy to be able to sort that out once you figured out. Most people miss that upside down one. They get the three upright ones, but then miss the, up, the upside down one. Um, but some of these, the key to solving them is to color code them in some way with an outline of a marker so that you can count them. But that's great. So that's another idea of a brain teaser puzzle. Let's look at this one. I want you to find the things that are wrong in this picture. And I'll give you a clue. There are eight of them. There are eight mistakes in this picture. Responses we get here. All right. Do you want us to point out the different? Uh, yeah, if the somebody, stakes. If somebody writes it, I'll point it out on the picture. Okay. Um, I see the um where he's trying to hit there. He's going through one of the yeah. So one of the balls yeah. is in the cue stick. Mm -hmm. Yes. So he's pierced this ball with the cue stick. That's one of them. Anybody see any other mistakes in this picture? There's like a, a fried egg or something. Yeah, there's a fried <laughs> egg on the table. Good. Um. I think the one pool stick is a little curved. Yeah, the one pool stick is kind of curved. I don't think it would do very well. Yep, so that's three of them. Feet backwards. What? The, his um, shoes, the one in the back, his yep. shoes are his backwards. Shoe, his foot is going backwards. He's very misformed here. Yep. Four more. Shoes on, well, shoes on wrong. I think that's, legs yeah. are backwards. Yeah. Not sure if we hit them all. <laughs> so the other ones that the answers have are that the lights are not over the table. So okay. normally um, a light would be centered here and this would oh. be over on the table. So the light is not centered. That's another okay. one. The other thing is that none of the balls have stripes or numbers. They all just are plain balls. So there would be two types of balls if people were playing. Um, this leg is not like, the, it's too oh. long compared to all the other legs on the table. And I'll be honest, I didn't find this one. This hand has six fingers a thumb and five Thank fingers. <laughs> so that one is a really hard one to find. These type of puzzles make you pay attention and they also make you kind of think deductively of what's normal and what's out of the norm. 
for these types of things. So it's just a different way for our brain to think. And I lied. I have a second puzzle book that I'm using for some of these puzzles. So um, Rebus puzzles or wacky wordies are, are what they're sometimes called are the next kind of puzzle that we're going to look at. But they're usually picture puzzles or picture riddles or word riddles that use images or words in a certain way to convey a phrase or a message. And the ones that are going to follow, I got out of this puzzle book. Also, I believe I got it off of Amazon. Um, you will all get a PDF version of the slides, so you'll have the information about these books um, when you get the slides, so you don't have to write it down, you'll have it. But let's see if we can figure out what these puzzles mean. Any ideas? See if a couple people are on the same track here. Okay. okay, banana split. Banana split. So the word banana is split in the middle. So banana split. How about this one? Um, all right, Seven, seventh inning stretch. Yes, seventh inning <laughs> stretch. So it's the seventh, it's the seventh inning. So there were six and then the seventh inning and it's stretched, yes. How about this one? Uh, eggs over easy. Yep. Or three eggs so, over easy. Yeah. So eggs. So there are more than one egg. So eggs and they're over easy. So it's like a positional thing. So eggs over easy. How about this one? All right, foreign language. Yeah, so foreign language, which is kind of a play. So yeah. for is in the word language. So it's in the middle. So for in language, which then is like foreign language. So those are rebus puzzles. There are also some rebus puzzles that you sound out the puzzle to come up with a word. So here are several of them. And let's do the first one together and then I'll see if you can do the other ones. So that top one, there's a loop minus the P. So Lou, then you're gonna add 10. So Lou, 10, and then add ant, Lou, tenant is how these work. So see if you can solve any of the others. See. Okay. Number two, mm -hmm. infinity. Infinity. So N, fin, that picture is a little dark, but it's a fin. Knit T. So infinity. That's adding all those together. Correct.
Any other takers on the other three? Uh, the third one, dinosaur. Nope. Nope. I think that would be the third one. At least not according to the answer in the book. Let's do the third one. So D, we're going to start. That lovely little picture here is bait. So debatable. So debatable is mm. this third one. This one's hard because it has a minus. The minuses are harder. So this one is G. This is a comet, but you take off the C. So comet minus C. So G omet tree. So geometry is what this one is. And then the last one, let's do it together. So these are texts. Sometimes you have to figure out what the picture is, but tax Z cabin, but minus the in. So taxi cab is that last one. So those are other types of rebus puzzles that use images and pictures. And we don't think this way on a daily basis. So this kind of having to think in these different ways makes your brain sweat. Now I didn't look, but I'll bet we were pretty close to our 20 minutes. So you can put a check mark on your daily schedule today that you did your 20 mi minutes of making your brain sweat today. But what I want you to do is I want you to always be on the lookout for new, novel, and challenging things that you can do for your brain. Different types of puzzles different genres of books or music to expose yourself to, cooking with new and different ingredients or recipes or learning about the culture while you're cooking a new meal, planting new types of plants in your garden, exploring new places when you walk, hike, or bike, or drive, um, anything new and different that you can expose your brain to on a regular basis counts as this new novel and challenging things to really challenge your brain. So now I will open it up to questions. Does anybody have any questions about cognitive fitness or anything else that maybe came to mind while we were talking about these things? Actually, I did get a question um, pretty quickly. Um, okay. I had been told to encourage elders to maintain a routine to avoid confusion and disorientation. Does this routine reduce cognitive fitness? You know, I guess my answer to that is it could, but I think there are ways that you could keep their daily routines rather um, predictable for them so they function well but build in those brain challenging breaks as part of their regular routine. So let's say they get out of the house once a day. You don't have to go to the same place every time. You're still leaving the house, but you can go to a different place every day. So I think routine is really important for us as we get older. It helps keep us oriented, especially if we have any kind of mild cognitive impairment. But I still think even for people with mild memory issues or mild cognitive issues, you still can build in some of these challenging things. And you have to compare what a baseline is. So what would be challenging for someone who has a mild cognitive impairment would not be challenging for me. So you have to keep that baseline. But anything you can do to still instill some new novel and challenging things for older people is still good because 
even as we get older, we still need to work on keeping our cognitive fitness and building that cognitive reserve for our protection mechanism. So I hope that kind of answers that. Um, someone else asked, does involvement in the creative arts increase brain fitness? Yes, especially if you are creatively challenged like I am. I should do a lot of creative tasks because they are very hard work for me. Now, if you are a very creative person and you're doing things that are just enjoyable, you need to figure out how to make them more challenging for them to count as a brain fitness. But yes, they painting, um, drawing, anything creative can be considered music, you know, composing music or playing more difficult songs if you're a musician. All of those things can definitely count as cognitive fitness. You just have to make sure that you really are feeling like you're making your brain sweat for those 20 minutes a day. And then the rest of the time you do it at your enjoyable pace or the enjoyable part. Great question though. Um. Another one, how do you overcome the fear of attempting these puzzles? And I assume those are in reference to some of the more difficult crossword puzzles. Yeah. You know, I think the, the best way to overcome the fear for me is to tell myself that I am doing it for the goodness of my brain. I am not going to feel bad that I only get a couple of answers in the 20 minutes I worked on it. I'm going to look at it and say, I just spent that 20 minutes really thinking hard and I just improved my brain. And now I'm going to put that hard puzzle aside and I'm going to go do stuff I enjoy more and am more comfortable with. It's kind of a mindset. You, it, physical activity is the same way. You can be very uncomfortable getting into a fitness routine or not wanting to do yoga in front of other people or not wanting to go outside and do it because somebody might see your tight sweatpants or whatever it is. Um, just look at it as that self-improvement part for you. Even if you don't solve it, it's okay. The, just the process of working on it and thinking about it and trying to come up with an answer, that's what brain, brain fitness activities are. Not getting the answer right when you do it. It's the process of thinking through it and it being hard to think through it. So just look at it as your challenge for the day. And if you're doing it at home or even with somebody in your family, you know, you can laugh about it when you don't do it the right way. That's okay. It's a process. It's working on it that it, it's important, not getting the right answer. Um, this next one, um, I like how it's kind of made me chuckle. Why is counting such an important part of doctor's visits? And I assume we're talking about like the mini mental yeah. uh, um, <laughs> assessments. Yeah. And, and usually those counting that you're going to do is count down by threes from a hundred. So, you know, it's because it's a higher level cognitive functioning. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all can count from one to 10. That's not the challenge. But if we're given a number and then we're told that we have to subtract a number and keep subtracting it, that is actually difficult. That is a, that is a lot of processing that your brain has to do to kind of picture those numbers and do that subtraction in your head or addition. It's usually subtraction that is done mm -hmm. because it's more difficult. Um, and that's why, because it's a higher level processing. And on those, um, those mental checkups that you get at the doctor's office, those are like a moment in time of how your brain is working. Now, I'll tell you, some days you probably, some years you go to the doctor and you don't have any problem doing it. Other days you may struggle and you may have had a bad night's sleep. You may have been more nervous. Maybe your blood pressure was high and that made you nervous. And then you couldn't remember the numbers. 
So there's lots of factors. It's just a, it's a moment in time, but it's just, if you have trouble doing it, then it's just a little red flag that you're having a little bit of problems with that processing. And maybe you can't do it on the spot and you get home and you can do it with no problem. That's totally understandable too. But it's just, it's just a way for doctors to screen if there are some processing things that are getting jumbled in your brain. And it's just an early warning sign of maybe some follow-up testing is needed. But number subtractions are a higher level processing, um, especially in this day and age where we all do everything on a calculator. Um, so doing it in your head is more of a challenge and that's why they do it. I'm gonna do a couple more questions. We've had a lot come in tonight, so thank you everyone. Um, a good friend of mine is definitely changing. She has um, a boyfriend who is 90. They both have grown children, a lot of support. I'm calling her more and more and getting her more involved in what I'm doing. Is there anything else you can recommend maybe to activate the brain? Yeah, you know, anything that she might enjoy, um, you know, uh, jigsaw puzzles are a great thing that, you know, you can kind of have out on the table in the house and, you know, people can work on them at different times during the day or any type of, um, you know, if, if they like to watch things on TV, maybe you could find some um, shows about some new travel areas that no one has gone to, you know, anything that's new and different. And it can be on TV. You can still learn things from a TV show and it still can be cognitive fitness, but I would look for new and different things that I don't know if you're getting together with this person at all, but you could maybe even take a board game um, or a card game over and play with them. Uh, a lot of our our old traditional board games and card games are really great for the brain if you don't do it on a regular basis. So anything that you might enjoy doing and just conversation is really good for the brain, especially as we get older. So the fact that you're calling them and having a daily conversation, that's a step in the right direction too. And I think we have time for one more. Okay. Um, can you comment on any reading or book clubs? There's probably yeah. online um, book clubs out there nowadays. Um, and I know the local libraries have um, book clubs. I know Orange, um, because I looked into this for someone, they were meeting both virtually and in person at the library. So that might be a good place to try. Yeah, I, think, I think the libraries are adding a lot of their programming back. I think they're still keeping a lot of it virtual, but they're they're doing maybe some hybrids. So yeah, I would check your local libraries, your local senior centers to see what's going on. Um, I might you might even just Google virtual book clubs because there might be some or start your own. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have a group of friends that like to read, you can get a free Zoom account. And you can do your own book club and you guys can do it. If you're not comfortable getting together, you can do your own virtual book club together. Um, and some books at the library that they use for book clubs have the questions in the back and everybody can get it from the oh, library. Right. And you, you could just start your own and um, you can get a free Zoom account and do, I think, a 40 minute um, class for free. So, yeah, do your own. That'd be good. Learn Zoom, and that's a good cognitive fitness activity, and, and lead that book group yourself, and that, that's a good challenge for you as well. So, thank you, everyone, for your questions yes. tonight. Thank you so much. And, and appreciate that. Today. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, um, Nicole and myself, we are both care navigators with our Alzheimer's disease and dementia support program. Um, feel free to take down my number, my email address, and you're welcome to call me with any referrals you might have. Um, we can discuss the program and how we really help 
um, people in our community. Um, the goal I would say of our program is to keep people at home as long as possible, um, but we do have resources if people do need to make that move um, to facility if, if necessary. Um, our two dementia specialists at JFSA are Dr. Elizabeth O'Toole and Dr. Constance Magulius. Um, they come to us on site at our Allison's Place Clinic and they complete um, you know, a really in-depth assessment of um, our clients to see where they're at with their memory um, needs. And then we all know Leanne, she's um, <laughs> our presenter tonight, but she is also a huge help in um, being a facilitator for our Savvy Caregiver Workshop and our dementia support group, which we offer ongoing throughout the year. So if that is something of interest to you, I can get you connected to those groups. And then Frank Petrelli, um, he is our general psychologist. So um, someone asked about the numbers and counting backwards, he'd be the person doing that with you. Um, he does our um, neurological assessments. And then we have, um, here's a list of our resources. Um, you know, we have, again, the Savvy Caregiver Workshop and the support group that are offered throughout the year. Um, we also have respite available for clients and their caregivers, especially if they are in need of a break, so we can certainly discuss that. And um, we also have our Brain Health, Brain Health and Wellness Initiative Series. And next month, Leanne will be back with us um, presenting on reading and the brain. So it'll be next um, April 28th um, from 6.30 to 7.30. So again, please feel free to give me a call or um, email if you have any questions. Um, really appreciated all the feedback tonight. Um, we had a lot of nice comments. Yes, yeah, thank you all for being here. Thank you. Have a good evening.